All right, so on tonight's stream, we're going to cover three uh, art movements, mainly focus on mannerism and Baroque art. Uh, there's already some replays of other uh, Renaissance streams that other teachers have done, so I'm not going to mention too much the Renaissance. That's a topic that's been covered a lot. And I'm sure your history teachers have covered that a lot. Uh, anybody here did not cover Renaissance during the year already in the chat room? I might want to mention the Renaissance in a few words, but uh, tonight we'll focus more about mannerism that very few students or some teachers teach at all, and the Baroque art, which is also a very big, large art movement. So let's start with the Renaissance, okay? The Italian Renaissance, the course, our course, the AP Europe course starts in 1450, and this year it ends in 1914 or World War One. So why did they drop us in 1450? Kind of like the invention of the printing press or the height of the Renaissance. So uh, when we talk about the Italian Renaissance, by the way, does anyone recognize any of these images on the screen? Let's say you get this in the test, they'll probably tell you the name of the artist. Anyone recognize? Of course, that's the famous Mona Lisa. Very good. Anything else? Mona Lisa painted by anyone? Da Vinci, Leonardo Da Vinci very well. So the Renaissance is kind of like the art that is known for like, for the first time, if you want to start, the course starts with Renaissance, the first time you're trying to depict people in a realistic sense. Most of art up to like modern art is basically trying to capture uh, accuracy, trying to get closer to a uh, realistic viewpoint of people. In the center here, we have the statue of uh, Michelangelo, the Pieta, the mother of Christ holding uh, Christ. And here we, on the right side, we have the Duomo, the dome in um, in Florence, which is like the first like standing huge dome that was built during the Renaissance. And again, for a thousand years, nobody can know how to build a big dome. They all collapsed. They didn't have this knowledge going back to antiquity. So again, Renaissance is a rebirth, going back to the classics of Rome and uh, Greek, uh, sculpture and architecture and writings, that was all about in the Renaissance. And it's all about perfection. Most fam One of the most famous paintings, the School of Athens by Raphael, uh, kind of depicts, you know, all the classic themes of Renaissance painting. We have here, anyone knows any kind of characteristic of Renaissance? What did you study in the Renaissance? Renaissance is famous for what? If you had an essay about it, you need to give outside evidence to depict the Renaissance. What are the most famous key elements of the Renaissance? Anyone? So we have things here, we might see uh, vivid colors or bright colors, realistic. Okay, so realistic is one thing, uh, or uh, sometimes idealistic, you might portray it, that people look way, way more perfect than even than real bright colors, single uh, point perspective, very good perspective is another famous thing of the Renaissance. So it seems like you see there's one group of people over here, there's another group of people over here, and then like we can see all the way in the back. So how do I get that? I create an element of perspective. It seems layered. So before this painting was painted, they probably, Raphael, drew lines to see this is the first part, it's the second part, this is the third part. So it gives uh, a feeling that these guys are way further up than these guys, even though he painted on the same level. So that's a uh, single point perspective that is created by the Renaissance. So Renaissance is like really, really amazing, beautiful art. So when we talked about kind of the characteristics of the Renaissance, we're gonna talk about realism uh, for the first time. People look real more or anatomically correct uh, perspective, bright colors, realistic movements, and anatomy. The human anatomy of this painting looks a lot more real than the anatomy of, you know, if you looked at any, the most of the art in the Middle Ages, people like that doesn't look like a human body. They actually excavated some of these artists like Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci excavated bodies to see how they physically look to really, really get the accuracy. Anyone recognize this statue over here? Who is this? Who is the most famous uh, sculptor of the Renaissance? Guy standing over here. So this is the famous 
Michelangelo did this. This is the famous David by Michelangelo. We're also talking about a nude statue. And we're also talking about kind of like uh, anatom uh, the anatomy is correct. And he's kind of like portrayed like as a Roman god. And again, we're talking about the Renaissance. Renaissance means a rebirth. A rebirth of what? Of interest in the classics, such as the Greeks and the Romes. And they excavated a lot of these old statues in Italy during the Renaissance and started to look at these and this art and they said wow this is beautiful side note interestingly enough because a lot of these statues were you know under the ground or like buried for a long time when they came out a lot of them were just white so most artists have said oh they must have done it in the old days all white so we should do it exactly the same way but in reality a lot of this art was painted the paint just came off so classic what they understood as being classic a lot of times is statues or images being completely white Another classic example of perfection and beauty is, again, Raphael is probably does the best like Renaissance uh, art painting. Uh, you see the beautiful vivid colors of the Madonna uh, in the meadow with the uh, like beautiful colors, red, blue, we can see behind is very, very re relaxed, very serene. And we're, when we do compare and contrast, we're going to see Baroque has a lot of tension and mannerism is very, a lot more darker. So this is the ideal time of the Renaissance. Okay. So that's pretty much, you know, in the Renaissance, you probably studied that a lot more. So I'm not going to go too much about the Renaissance, but it's idealistic, beautiful images that's the beginning of our course we're talking about looking back to greek and roman times and we're trying to portray people in a positive way some of the paintings have a christian themes in them but some of it have more of like uh looking into greek and roman uh historical saying or classical things like uh, like venus and so forth so let's talk about mannerism okay so renaissance means rebirth so the next art movement that pops up after the renaissance around 1527 which is some people even call it late renaissance so some people still consider the new art movement as a part of the renaissance so the name derived from students or people who really really admired michelangelo and Raphael, their followers so they painted in the manner of Raphael and the manner of michelangelo so that's what the term the style the term mannerism uh came for but if the renaissance was all about perfection mannerism was kind of like a lot of more distortion so it's kind of like elongated figures twisted figures uh more theatrical style and not always religious topics so we're also going to talk about uh more self-portraits became more uh popular during that time the lightning was less bright than uh the renaissance painting was which kind of like in the symmetry was gone and the focus was no longer in the center as we saw Raphael, the previous painting is all in a lot more intense and darker colors. So that's kind of what mannerism was all about. And let's get the historical context. So why do we switch all of a sudden from Renaissance, uh, beautiful, bright colors, accurate colors? Why are we moving to darkness or distortion? Where does that start? So the context is in, um, is uh, the Protestant Reformation or Martin Luther happens in 1517 and also is the sack of Rome in 1527. Um, Rome, which is the center where the Pope uh, is situated, is being sacked, interestingly enough, by other Christian soldiers. They basically sack uh, the papacy because they're out of money and the Pope himself, you know, has to like uh, has to hide or ransom himself. It's a very horrible time for a lot of people. So the optimism of the Renaissance goes into more of a darker period. So the uh, mannerism a lot of times in most history book is around 1520s to the 1600s. It starts around 1527. And again, I say art movement doesn't start like people don't wake up in the morning and say i'm a mannerist painting it's no longer renaissance it's kind of like a process a lot of people are still painting idealistic but there's slowly starting to be a movement of artists starting to do a little bit more uh radical paintings and um every new art movement is basically rebelling against the previous um art nobody's really happy with what is done before they maybe see uh, the situation before is being too commercial. Every art movement basically goes against the previous art movement. Now, where did it originated? It originated in Rome and in Florence, which were the center of 
art. And um, from there, it kind of expanded a little bit outside of Italy. Now, interestingly enough, one of the most famous painter of uh, Mannerist art was not even an Italian. He did study in Italy, and his name was El Greco, who worked in paint. A lot of the great painters of the Mannerist painting actually were in Spain. So it spread across Europe. It started in Italy and actually achieved its peak in Spain. So where does it start? Where does Mannerism actually start? So again, it starts with the followers of Michelangelo and Raphael. And we can actually see that Michelangelo himself is turning a little bit more dark in his later painting. Uh, Michelangelo basically started to be a little bit more depressed. So there was a lot of darkness in his art. So this is uh, his famous, a famous piece of the Sistine Chapel, which is in Vatican City. It's basically the ceiling. And this is called The Last Judgment. Now, interestingly enough, when we talk about self-portrait, which is a fascinating topic. I was actually reading a whole book about self-portrait. We actually talked uh, specifically about Michelangelo. Um, he actually, artists usually put themselves inside paintings in kind of an idealistic way, kind of like their ego is in here. But um, Michelangelo puts himself, interestingly enough, in this figure, this Saint Bartholomew, whose skin, the story said that he was skinned, uh, he actually, puts himself in the face of the skin um, uh, St. Bartholomew. So this is very, very dark. Why did Michelangelo, this is the way he looks, will just shove himself and make himself like uh, in this uh, basically skinned out body. The story went that um, St. Bartholomew, and again, most, you don't have to know too much Christian history, but a lot of the early founding fathers of the church, the apostles, most of them like died in a very horrible way. So it's interesting why he is he putting himself into uh, this uh, very, very sad uh, kind of like droopy face position because it seems like he was going through a dark period and just seeing that life, you know, is, is short and everyone pretty much dies. So this darkness is kind of the beginning of a lot of manners painters are following the lead of their uh, idol, if you will, uh, Michelangelo. So Michelangelo is the first, basically, if you want a founding father of the Mannerist movement, and many of his followers continue after. So we're just going to talk about uh, two painters of the Mannerist period. And if you have any questions regarding them, you can just drop it in the chat. So the first famous artist is Parmigianino, uh, if I said his name uh, correctly, which basically translate the little one from Parma. A lot of these artists kind of like, some of them have a nickname, so they're more known for their nick nickname, like El Greco means the Greek. Sometimes you have a complicated name and you just end up using your um, your short name, like Botticelli, which like means like little barrel, but you know, who's gonna go around and call somebody today little barrel. But anyway, uh, so Parma Giannino came from Parma in Italy, which is not the center of art in Italy. And uh, interesting enough, he was raised by his mother. His father died when he was young and his uh, two uncles and all of them were involved in the painting industry. So he actually got trained by his uncle. So he basically grew up in a family of painters and Actually, interestingly enough, he was a very daring artist for that time. He was very experimental. And that's another interesting characteristic of the Mannerist painters, because a lot of them are basically, why there's so many rules in painting a beautiful, perfect uh, painting of the Renaissance? And also, some of them are saying it's so complicated, or they achieved this amazing painting. How can you compete with Raphael? How can you compete with Michelangelo? You can't compete. This is just perfect. So the next stage is maybe me as an artist, I want to start being experimental. Maybe I want to go away from realistic and show a little bit different side. What's the opposite of realistic? Maybe something unrealistic. What's the opposite of like ideal beauty? Maybe I'm going to go with something a little bit more uh, brutal. So he was a very daring artist who was willing to try to do uh, different things. And during his life, uh, Giorgio Vasari is our main primary sources to the life of many of these artists. He was a low-level painter himself, but he wrote uh, 
like a very, very famous book called The Biography is of all the major artists. So that's for the first time we know all the background stories of all the greatest artists of the time. So he basically said that Parmigianino was celebrated as a Raphael reborn. He kind of looked like Raphael, some people said, and he painted in the style of Raphael. He was also actually known, if we're going to go about looks, he was known as the most uh, beautiful painter of the time. That's what he was seen. I don't know. Anyone look at this painting. Does he look like the most beautiful painter you ever seen? Thumbs up, thumbs down. I'll show you another painting. No. Okay. Nobody liking anybody else? Parmigianino? Yes? No? Just one person? Um, and later in life also, we know that he really got into the study of alchemy. And some people have speculated that, you know, he probably mixed the wrong um, uh, chemicals and probably die or smell a lot of that stuff. So we don't know if that's the case about that situation. But you know what? Also, I looked at one of his paintings. He looked very, very similar to me to Arya Stark. Anyone see the similarity? Am I the only one who's seen the similarity? Yes, thumbs up like Arya Stark, thumbs down Arya Stark. Or I don't even know who Arya Stark is. Game of Thrones, anyone? Doesn't he look like her? Anyway, not seeing the connection. He looked like Arya Stark to me. That's what I saw. Anyway, so thumbs up. Okay, some people are seeing the connection. I actually, when I first uh, saw her in Game of Thrones, I was like, she looks very familiar. Like, I, it took me like a, a year until I was like, she looks like Prima Janino. And I actually looked it up online to see if anybody else saw the connection between them. And I think she posted or somebody posted that there are actually somebody else, uh, that there is similarity between them. I was like, I knew it. I'm not imagining. There's a little Arya Stark in them. But anyway, he was like written about a lot about his beauty. And uh, Vazeri wrote that uh, Francisco was beautiful and had a very graceful features, more like an angel than a human being. So that kind of like goes to show like this guy was considered like, you know, other than an amazing painter, he was considered like one of the best looking artists of the time. Now, uh, this, we're going to talk just about a couple of his paintings, but this is kind of classically what we're going to start talking about mannerism. When he arrives in Italy, he's trying to make a reputation for himself. So he presents the self portrait um, uh, to the Pope, trying to uh, kind of like uh, uh, kind of make a kind of a calling card for himself. Now, if you look at this painting, it's very, very uh, interesting. It's a convex mirror. And we can start seeing some of the uh, features of mannerist painting. So we talked about elongation. Look at the length of this hand. I mean, if I put my hand in a situation like this, I mean, it looks like in a normal way, but his hand looks super, super long. So that's one of the key feature of mannerism that elongation, certain things look really, really long, not realistic. But again, this is a beautiful painting. Look at the crispiness. He's showing a lot of talent uh, in this painting basically to say, look, I can like do a self-portrait of myself and I can kind of curve it a little bit. So this is not a flat painting. It's kind of curved. So I have the skill to do uh, something like that. We can also see the gray colors from behind. So yes, it's realistic, kind of like the Renaissance, but the hand is very, very long and it's not really realistic. The background is really, really the grays. There's a lot of grays and yellows in uh, mannerist art. So I personally think this is a beautiful uh, painting. It shows a lot of skills. And he did this only like in 21. Very, very impressive. Now, I thought I had another mannerist painting. OK, here's another one that we're going to talk about. Another famous uh, painting, probably like the most famous painting when people want to explain what mannerism is all about, is the Madonna and the long neck. Now, look at this painting over here. So some people are saying like, yuck, like compared to if we do like Raphael, the beautiful Madonna. And again, all the features of mannerism we're going to see here. Look at the length of this baby Jesus. This is a very, very long uh, baby. And look at the Madonna. She's called the Madonna with the long neck. So it's not a brain surgery to figure it out that the neck is very, very long. The leg is very, very long. So you just take this usually compressed Madonna and you just kind of stretch her up and everything is super, super long. Look at this length. And then also behind, very, very interesting here. I don't know. We have this long column here. This person is super, super short, way behind. Did everyone see this? 
So it's kind of like what is going on in this painting. So this is what we're talking about. Uh, Parmigianino is very, very experimental. What is he? What is he doing here? He's taking the Madonna that we've seen, like in thousands of painting, all idealistic and beautiful, and now he's taking and kind of stretching her out. And you can also see that the the baby Jesus is like slipping down, almost like falling down. So it's kind of like another thing is about the tension and this art that is coming around. We can also see the leg is kind of curved to the side, what she's doing with the back of her foot. So kind of like all of the twisted figures, that's a part of mannerism. Elongation is another thing that we're going to see. The hand, a lot of times if you're going to see a painting, if you have to, to know if it's mannerist or, or renaissance, the hands, the fingers are always long. That's another key feature of the renaissance art. So the Madonna and the long neck, kind of like probably the most popular painting to show what mannerism is. Are we doing okay? Can everyone hear me loud and clear? And again, if I, great. So if I do a compare and contrast, here's a beautiful compare and contrast, two different Madonnas. Raphael Madonna on the left, look at her. She's like blonde. She's outdoors in this beautiful scene. A lot of way also, you know, way to know it's Renaissance, it's always triangles. I don't know if you, your teacher always taught you about Renaissance with the triangle. It's kind of like this, uh, this tri uh, like kind of like the Trinity. So it's always like a triangle, beautifully symmetrically working. And here we have this like whoop up around, like kind of like twirling. So it's like idealistic, beautiful. And look at this baby almost slipping down versus this like perfect, you know, uh, anatomically built. Uh, baby and nature, very, very idealistic. So compare and contrast, that's another thing you might have to do or talk about um, between art movements. Another way we're going to compare and contrast is we have this famous uh, painting here by Leonardo da Vinci, um, The Last Supper. And again, how do you see a Renaissance? Why is this a Renaissance painting? Anyone? from what we explained, what makes this a Renaissance painting? Anyone, so what are the characteristics of Renaissance painting that I know that this is Renaissance? So it's realistically, these people are built correctly, all around the same size, bright colors, all the things that we talked about, perspective. Single point perspective. All right, so again, you can see it looks like it's going all the way in the back. So it seems like there's a lot of space going on behind here. That's perspective again. And again, Renaissance, everything is organized. Everyone is in the same line. And talking about, do you remember the triangle? Look it up, triangle one. Triangle on Jesus. It's very, very organized. You get like everyone in groups of three. Jesus is in the center. If you measure it probably correctly, you'll see the Jesus, Jesus exactly in the center. That's all the characteristic of the Renaissance. Now, it, you, it might not see bright colors because this was also an experimental technique. Um, he did this, uh, Leonardo did this in this very new technique of fresco. He painted it quickly and dried it up. So the colors just went away very, very quickly from the get-go. And he had to fix it throughout the years. But the, the original was a lot more brighter than this. So he has a lot of bright colors. So that's kind of about Leonardo. So now again, if I do a compare and contrast, sorry, uh, another painter of the, uh, of the time, uh, Tintorento, this is his version of... The Last Supper. So anyone can tell me what the difference is between this and this is? It's the same historical thing. So what's the difference? There's a lot less colors. So first off, here is a way for me if I get a, a document, if I'm not sure about, about what uh, what kind of art movement it is, one thing I can know, Renaissance bright color, this is a lot more darker. Another thing, mannerism, uh, in case I didn't mention it before, is a lot of people shoved together in a small pack of group. 
So more emphasis on light. Another key feature is we're going to start talking about when we talk about mannerism, we're going to talk about Baroque. There's a lot more darkness and a lot more light coming from the top. So it's basically if Renaissance is the lights are on, Baroque or mannerism, the lights are turned off and you might turn a little light, a little flash in or a little match to turn a light on a dark situation, which could be more realistic in a sense, but probably those meetings were a little bit more darker at night. Anyone can find where Jesus is? And the Leonardo is very, very easy to find where Jesus is because he is exactly in the center. Where is Jesus? Beep me up, Jesus. So with the halo. Very good. So Jesus is here with the halo. One easy way to find Jesus. So technically this is the center, but Jesus is not in the center of the table. So he's all around. So it's kind of like diagonal uh, character. So instead of putting like Leonardo, the table straight in, uh, in front of me, like in an organized way, you see over here in this line, uh, Tintoreno basically took it and like twisted it to the size, shoved all these people together. We got like angels flying uh, from, from the top. And again, we got elongated figures. We have a lot more action and drama going on. If the other Leonardo was everything was serene and calm, here we have like this darkness uh, coming over, uh, darker colors, a lot more harshness. We have the angel, angels floating. So from the calm, Last Supper to a lot more action. Uh, Supper of Tintoreno shows us the difference between mannerism and uh, the Renaissance. All right, last painter we're going to talk about mannerism before we get into Baroque is El Greco, which, interesting enough, uh, El Greco translate to the Greek. His real name is, you know, Tedopolis. Very complicated to say. I'm not going to try to attempt it. Uh, but he was born in Crete, and he studied in Rome and in Venice. So he studied in Italy and saw the Renaissance art, but uh, he made most of his career in Spain. So he was born in Greece, but basically a Spanish uh, painter. He settled in Spain in the 1570s, and basically most of his life worked in the city of Toledo, and a lot of his paintings uh, depict the background of the city of Toledo. And he worked usually either for the court of uh, the monarch of Spain, Philip II, he probably studied Philip II, the son of Charles V. And he also worked for the Catholic Church in Spain. Now, he is probably the second or the first most, with Parmigianino, the most famous painter of uh, the Mannerist period of time. And he's also known for very elongated figures. And he's also known for a lot of his painting, there's a lot of yellows and there's a lot of green. So it's kind of like in a trouble uh, grays in the background. So it's kind of like uh, uh, there's a lot more tension and a lot more emotion with darker colors. So if the Renaissance, everyone, their body was white, in, in a Greco painting, a lot of the bodies are kind of like more gray, which is kind of like more of a color of like decaying or a lot more tension, like white elegant beauty versus gray, kind of like thinking maybe death is around the corner. So this is his masterpiece. His most famous uh, painting is the uh, burial of the Count of Orgues, which was a real person in the 14th century. And the story goes that during his burial, there was like a, a miracle that basically happened. Um, all, a lot of uh, famous historical figures all of a sudden showed up, and including St. Stephen on the left and uh, St. Augustine uh, on the right, the famous uh, fourth century uh, uh, bishop. And they actually are bearing him down over here. And we've seen all this crowd of dignitaries in the back background. So the painting is divided into two parts and the bottom is the miracle that happened in the funeral of Count Orgaze, who was uh, 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 a famous person, uh, a wealthy person that um, uh, that is being commemorated. And on the top, we kind of bring all these historical, we have Jesus, we have Mary, uh, we have God. So all the action on the top. So again, how do I know this is mannerism? I have the yellows, I have the grays, a lot more darker. Also because El Greco was born in Greece, he had the influence also of Byzantian art. Byzantian art has a lot of uh, golds 
uh, in it. If you guys live around, if you ever pass a Greek Orthodox Church, you might see a lot of like more golden Jesus. So that's another thing that we know that is happening from over there. And interesting enough, the painting where it's located just underneath is where the grave of uh, Count or Gaze is actually located. So people look at this painting and they're like, they're looking down. They're like, wow, this, this person over here is like his literally buried over here. So you can kind of see the motion of um, St. Augustine and St. Stephen are like bringing his body down. Like what an amazing, amazing miracle. So it's kind of like the division of like somber earth in the bottom and the uh, heaven on the top, kind of two dimensional, two different stories in one uh, painting. And that painting got a, got a lot of attention, made him very, very famous. And he got a lot of uh, commissions for churches after this uh, amazing painting. Another thing that he did a lot, he loved to paint his town of Toledo, even though he wasn't native to Spain, he had a lot of, lot of appreciation. We see this background. Some people kind of see this as kind of like even close to Van Gogh or something like that. Very kind of like modern art, like bright, vivid colors, like kind of breaking the rules. Uh, the sky looks really, really beautiful in this uh, background. He really had a lot of painting. You're going to see this blue in the back in many of his uh, El Greco uh, paintings. Um, St. Martin and the Beggar, again, very, very elongated uh, figures, a tongue twister saying 20 times elongated uh, constantly. And finally, the story of Lagon, Laocon, you have to speak Greek a little bit here, who was a Trojan priest. So from all of the art that El Greco made, this is his only painting that was not about a Christian or a local uh, painting. I mean, his only painting based upon the classics, the story of, of the Trojan priest who warned against um, and not to take the, the Trojan horse into, into the city of Troy that brought down. He basically was telling the truth, and for that he got punished. We see him here sacrifice. So you see the body is kind of twisted. We can see the fear, his tension in his eyes of, of being, uh, being killed, and again, the classic blue sky. So it's kind of like very, very uh, intense painting, very, very different than the beauty or the relaxation of the Renaissance, if you will. Uh, and again, let's, for example, we talked about Michelangelo Pieta in the beginning of Jesus all relaxed with Mother Mary on the top. Look at this Jesus. Again, we can see the, the, the gray colors that kind of reflect the decay and the death in the body in this uh, painting. So that's pretty much what we need to know about um, Mannerism. If there's any questions on mannerism, we can take them now. If you want, we can wait to the end. And we have one more art movement to cover today, and that's the art movement called Baroque. I have a whole stream on Baroque. If you want to watch the replays and a lot more details, just 60 minutes just on Baroque. But today we're doing a review, so we don't go into all the details. But general uh time frame that we're going to talk about or the term where it originated so baroque uh means a flawed pearl so just by the name you know that it's it's goes against perfection so if you want to think about the renaissance is a beautiful pearl baroque is kind of the deformed pearl so baroque is kind of close to mannerism that is a little bit more risque and more uh eccentric so uh baroque is straight after mannerism with a lot of influence from mannerism from the 1600 to the 1750. Also, the origins are in Rome and Italy. So we basically all three art movements start in Italy. So that's easy to remember. Uh, Baroque is not just in painting. There's also Baroque music. There's also uh, Baroque architecture. So it's not just painting, even though we're focusing here more probably about talking about uh, painting and uh, maybe a little bit more about architecture. Why did it happen? Kind of similar to, to uh, mannerism, the context is also the Reformation or the Counter-Reformation. A big part of why Baroque and Mannerist art is being produced is kind of to fight back the Protestant Reformation. A lot of it is Catholic art. They're using this as a tool to fight uh, the spread of Protestantism. And uh, Baroque art is basically larger than life. It basically is out to get you. It's not supposed to be peaceful. It's supposed to kind of overpower you, to make you believe or make you um, uh, connect to God. And that's what art did 
during that time. Remember, a lot of people uh, couldn't read and write uh, during that time. So art, a lot of times, was created to engage people and to make them believe, see a painting and think like, wow, like I feel the presence of God. You can't read about it, but if you see it, you might uh, feel the connection. So the context of the Baroque art movement is the Counter-Reformation that you probably already studied in class. Counter-Reformation is the attempt of the Catholic Church to fight back against the spread of Protestantism all across Europe. And in the Council of Trent, something that you need to also probably be aware of, this is where all the Catholics met together in a conference for around 18 years, talked about strategies to fight against the spread of Protestantism. One of the conclusions that they came into, or one of the decrees that they had that art need to be available to advertise to people uh, the truth in the Catholic way. So Baroque is kind of like a propaganda tool to fight and to spread the ideals of the Catholics. So you might do a compare and contrast also if you might write an essay in the exam about the different viewpoints about Catholic versus Protestant when it comes to art. There's so completely two different POVs, point of views. Uh, Catholics see art as a thing that is great to spread the word of God, a uh, way to connect to God, seeing the images and connecting to God. Uh, Protestants are against art, basically, because they read the Bible. One of the tenements of Martin Luther is Sola Scriptura, which basically says scripture alone. And it's mentioned in the Bible, thou shalt not make an ad, idol or a statue. So Protestants don't like statues. They see them as sinful, as kind of like... Uh, like a, uh, like you're worshiping like you know like a pagan form of art. So Protestants a lot of times when the Protestant Reformation started, they smash uh, statues and painting and so forth. They say the focus should be on the Bible. So Protestants, if you go today to churches, a lot of times if you walk in, if you see a lot of statues, a lot of music and drama, it's probably in a Catholic church. It's, if it's very relaxed and you don't see too much stuff around, it's probably uh, Protestant. All right, the Council of Trent, I know, was meant to reform the church, mostly just strengthen the church papacy. Well, I mean, the, the, the Council of Trent was mainly, yes, to, uh, to rebuild the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church needed to make some changes, not just because of the Protestant Reformation. They had a lot of uh, corruption issues. They had a lot of uh, uneducated uh, priests and so forth. So they had to clean house in that department too. But they also had to spread uh, the ideals of of uh of Catholicism, and uh, they had to fight the Protestantism. So spread their place, ideology to other places. They spread it also. They went to Africa. They went to Asia to try to spread Catholicism. And to some extent, it worked because, you know, Catholic Catholicism is the biggest uh, Christian sect to this day, more than a billion believers. Uh, so if we do a compare and contrast between, let's say, Renaissance or Baroque, or also Renaissance versus uh, Mannerism, so again, the Renaissance art is very idealized, and uh, Baroque is not idealized uh, necessarily, but some people say maybe it's a little bit more realistic. There's more darkness in the world. Um, Baroque will capture a moment in time, something that will just happen for a specific moment, and Renaissance art is kind of um, eternal. It's like something that can happen in any time, you know. Uh, Baroque and also Mannerism is a lot more dark, there's effects of lights. Renaissance is a lot more bright and clear. I don't know if you ever went to a museum and you've seen some of the Renaissance uh, paintings or if you've ever seen a Raphael, it's so clear and crisp. You think somebody actually took a picture. You're like, wow, this, this looks so real because it's so clear, you know. Uh, oil painting, that's another way of uh, one of the characteristics of uh, Renaissance painting. Um, uh, there's a lot more drama in Baroque art. There's a lot of more motion and emotions. You can see the drama, like people are like blood is coming out, people are crying. Uh, Renaissance painting usually are very calm, very relaxed. There's not too much drama going on. And finally, there's a lot of instability in Baroque or in mannerism, kind of like that baby Jesus, Jesus almost slipping down versus Renaissance that looks more stable, like nothing is falling down. Everyone is sitting down in a calm way like we saw in Da Vinci uh, last supper. 
So let's just talk about a few famous painters from the Baroque art. And again, if you want to see the whole uh, Baroque stream, just go into my uh, previous uh, stream about the borough. Most famous of them is Caravaggio. And again, everyone's got nickname. His name really was Michelangelo. Isn't that interesting? Uh, but he got a shorter name, Caravaggio, because that's the town where he grew grew up. Um, he had a very violent uh, and confrontational lifestyle, actually even killed a person. And his action and drama in real life was reflected in his art. So he was kind of like this, like, creative genius, basically insane genius, if you want. But he did exactly what the Counter-Reformation wanted. He created a lot of art that basically uh, made believers really, really feel something. You cannot watch in his painting and not feel something. And that's exactly what the Baroque uh, celebrated. And he's kind of considered the master of the light, the person that really created an art uh, with darkness. And he knew exactly how to bring the light into the center of the painting. For example, uh, the calling of St. Matthew, that we can kind of see, again, two-part painting over here. We're seeing Christ pointing into St. Matthew, and um, we don't see Christ actually here. We just see the hand, and we see Peter, and then we see over here St. Matthew, who the New Testament tells us was a money collector. It's kind of like, who? Like me? He's like, and the only way we know that it's connected to money, we see there's money on top of his uh, hat, and money on the table. And interestingly enough, also being more realistic, he took this historical event that happened in Galilee, like, you know, a thousand, six hundred years ago, and brought it into Italy. So another thing that Caravaggio did, he took historical figures and painted them in local places in modern Italy, and actually used uh, some of the models or some of the people, uh, people that he hung up around with. So they look they look very realistic to people. They're like, I know somebody who looks like that. So he's not making kind of like an ideal Jesus uh, necessarily or St. Matthew from this historical time. So that's one famous painting, The Calling of St. Matthew, Jesus Calling St. Matthew. Also across from that painting in the same church, we have the martyrdom of St. Matthew. Uh, we see St. Matthew here in the bottom and we see this person who was sent to assassinate him. We see the knife. We see the action, the drama coming over. We got this angel coming uh, down maybe to help or for, to rescue, but uh, we've seen the St. Matthew is not reaching for that. So again, a lot of drama, darkness, that's kind of like the Baroque feel with, filled with uh, a lot of action in motion and emotions are definitely the, the buzzwords, if you want, for Baroque art. Um, here we have the crucifixion of St. Peter. And if you studied your New Testament or you know a little bit background, we know that St. Peter asked to be crucified upside, upside down, not to be confused with uh, Jesus. And again, how do we know that this is a Baroque painting? We have, uh, we have motion in this painting. We have the actual process of the cross being lifted. We see three separate people. We see this guy pulling over here. We've seen this guy uh, holding the cross and this guy under getting in and lifting up. And again, it's very unstable. We might not know maybe the cross will flip over in a certain moment. Uh, look at St. Peter. Does not look idealistic over here. We can see he's an old man. The body, you know, shrivels up. So it's a lot of... Um, uh, the drama of the light, very good. So we can kind of see the darkness and we can kind of see the light coming in and popping to uh, this situation in this uh, painting. So again, if you see the darkness, the drama of the light, so again, just think about it like a movie theater. You go into the movie theater, it's dark, and then puff, the light comes up. So how do you capture that moment? And this is where Caravaggio was so good at. And many of the artists basically follow this technique with the light from him. Uh, Judith uh, beheading Holofernes. So again, we can see again the action, the drama. We're seeing like she's slashing his head. We've seen all that blood spew up. You cannot see a painting like this and just like be like whatever. If you walk in the museum and you see this stuff, it kind of draws you up. You're like, what is going on in this painting? Like Renaissance, it's calm. And now it's like like blood is spilling out. You know, what is going on in this painting? You know, I like her, the way she looks at him. She's kind of like, am I doing this right? I always liked, liked her face to look in that situation. 
uh, that's also an historical story in the Bible with Judith um, uh, killing uh, like a general from the opposite side. And finally to finish is like uh, David and Goliath. That's another, that's a very, very famous topic that a lot of Renaissance artists like to look at. But if you can see here, David does not look happy at all from basically uh, killing uh, Goliath. Uh, and again, we can see the darkness, we can see the body emerges. So the focus is going straight into him and uh, we're straight moving into the head. Now, one of the most interesting thing to blow your mind around, the guy whose Goliath head is actually self-portrait again. This is Caravaggio. Caravaggio painted himself into the head of Goliath. So he's actually going into basically, I am the villain. So I'm not going to go through the whole Caravaggio biography, but he's a very fascinating person. I highly recommend after the stream that you go and read up a little bit about him. But he got into a lot of trouble. He had to escape. He killed a person. He went into jail. But he was um, he knew a lot of people connected to, to the Pope. He knew a lot of people in the leadership of the Catholic Church. So he was trying to make a comeback to go back to Rome, maybe uh, thinking that he's going to get like a pardon for all of his crimes. And he painted a few things. This is one of the painting that he was going to offer to a cardinal uh, or hopefully to get to the Pope. It's kind of like, you know, I'm sorry for what I did, basically, kind of like looking back on his actions. So very, very interesting, the whole idea of self-portrait, how artists see themselves. So we saw Michelangelo in a self-portrait, and now we have Caravaggio, one of his last painting, very, very sad painting, the head of Goliath. Well, maybe not sad to you, I don't know, for me. Um, Let's talk about a sculpture, a very famous sculpture of the time is John Lorenzo Bernini, uh, who was also a famous, uh, he was a painter, he was an actor, he did a lot of things, he was a theater director, uh, but he's probably most known for being a sculptor, that, that was probably his uh, claim to fame, and um, he was known from a young age, actually met the Pope, and also his father, yes, Saint Teresa, uh, Teresa Ecstasy, that's one of his most famous sculpture. Very good, I'm glad some people are, uh, their teachers are teach, uh, teaching similar things. Now, let's look at his David. His David is very, very interesting if you do a compare and contrast between this David and Michelangelo David in the beginning. Can anyone tell me the difference between this David and the Michelangelo David? The Michelangelo David that we saw in the beginning? Do I have it here? So the first Michelangelo, the first David we saw, the Renaissance David was kind of standing like, yes, his David is, seems to be more moving. So this is the action. This is after he throws the stone on top of Goliath. So there's more action. There's motion. There's drama. You can kind of see his face, his, his lips. It's kind of like, mm, like, this is like the body turns around. So Michelangelo David was all like limp, just standing there like, you know, like a model, like barely moving. And this one is a lot more action and drama. So that's, again, the difference between um, kind of like a model statue in Renaissance. Baroque is more action, motion, drama, turning the body. Interesting enough, also, he actually is covered up a little bit. So Renaissance had more nudity when we get close to the Baroque. Uh, there's a lot more covering up, so uh, less exposure. Of course, he's also famous for creating uh, the colonnade all around that you still see to this day in St. Peter's Square, that beautiful round thing that kind of rounds you. Uh, St. Peter's Square, that design is also famous uh, for that. And as somebody mentioned, probably his most famous sculpture is the Ecstasy of St. Teresa who was very, very prominent in the Counter-Reformation, which we're not talking about that, but she told the story how an angel basically uh, pierced her, like you can see with this arrow over here, and she had a physical ecstasy, like you see her shoe drop down, and you can kind of see her body, she leans back, her mouth is opening, and look at this beautiful, like kind of like shimmering, or kind of like, like a waterfall behind, so if you zoom out of this thing, you can see kind of build it, is like this whole theater production and there's like rich people on the side sitting on top of like a stoop like seeing the whole drama uh sorry more like a booth like so it's really really beautiful and again look at the like the clove is kind of like 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 the clothing are folding this is very very interesting uh beautiful artwork 
Um, let's talk about a female artist. So we barely have female artists in the Renaissance that might, uh, or during, uh, or during most of the history that we're talking about AP Europe. Why there's so little female artists during that time? Anyone can answer why there's very, very few female artists. It's still kind of a very still, it's a very still like kind of like a sexist society uh, where the man is still dominated. So there are very, very few option for women. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, so women, not necessarily they were not allowed to paint, but women could not attend university. Women were expected to kind of stay home, raise children. So the Renaissance is just the beginning of several women starting to create, starting to write, but it's still rare. One thing we can generalize, most female painters, usually their father was a painter and that's one way they got into the painting industry. So one of the most famous Italian uh, painter from that time is Armista Gentileschi, uh, that she and her father were both a followers of Caravaggio. Her father actually was friends with Caravaggio and she's the first woman to be admitted to the Academy of Fine Arts in Florence. And she actually painted all around Europe. She actually even worked for uh, Charles I of England. She worked for the Medici uh, family. And, and this is a self portrait of herself that she put it herself in a painting, not really realistically. She was a lot heavier, but you know, she kind of like, change that up a little bit. Everyone wants to make themselves look a little bit better. Uh, she painted mainly uh, historical figures and mainly focused on women. So this is uh, Susanna and the Elders, the famous story from, uh, I think it's the book of Daniel. Check it out afterwards. I can swear on that one. Um, that the story goes that she went uh, to swim and these elders basically said, we're going to tell your your husband she had sex with us or something like that. And if you don't like give us some favors and she's kind of pushing them away and later on they got punished. So she was interested in topics, topics like when women are very, very uh, vulnerable in that uh, situation. And this is her, if you remember Caravaggio before in the slaying of Holofernes. So she did a similar uh, painting based upon that of her, uh, uh, of again, of uh, of uh, uh, Judith and her assistants basically slaying the head of Halifernes. And the interesting story behind this painting quickly is that uh, she was raped by one of her male teachers. Um, and it was very, very complicated issue. She had to go on a trial. She had to like, you know, uh, like uh, have some physical, like basically, torture to 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 uh to make sure that she's not lying it was a very horrible thing and the guy basically uh, managed to with some connection not to serve any jail time even though most people knew he was guilty so her revenge on him from that situation is she, again self-portrait she painted him over here as the person that is head being chopped off so it's interesting how art is becoming realistic with people taking historical events and bringing them into their art um finally quickly the last probably famous baroque painter of the time if you study a little bit dutch history i also have a stream about dutch history is rembrandt van rijn who painted in the netherlands and uh, also did a lot of like like 10 percent of his work is self-portrait throughout of his life and he was also very very influenced by uh caravaggio and we can see by the light and darkness now interestingly enough uh the Netherlands became a Protestant country, so it's not too many painting based upon religion. Uh, Dutch art is a lot more um, talking about a day-to-day -day activities. That's another way if you can depict or if you can recognize if it's Catholic or Protestant art, it's a lot of times uh, the topics uh, that Protestant might do are day-to-day -day things. Uh, he painted a lot of famous business people here, like we can see uh, this uh, business person here who's in the fur business, uh, Nicholas Rutz, a portrait that he did in 1631. Rembrandt made a lot of money in the early career by painting a lot of uh, rich people. Uh, this is a very famous painting that he did, the anatomy lesson of Dr. Tulp. Dr. Tulp over here is having an anatomy lesson. He's teaching in class and some people are observing and looking 
uh, at what he's doing, and some people are looking directly at us. This is the painting that made him really, really famous. How do I know, by the way, that this is not a Catholic painting? How do I know this is not a Catholic painting? What is this in painting that if I see it in the exam that I can say, you know, this is a Protestant painting? I mean, I said it's the Netherlands, so that could be one easy way to know. Any other reason? One way you can see a lot of times the clothing. Very, very good. The clothing. This is kind of like if you study Calvinism. This is kind of like more classic Calvinist clothing. A lot of like blacks. They a lot of times see colors, Protestant, the way see what we talked about their POV about art. A lot of times they see colors as vanity, uh, bright colors. It's kind of like, you know, you're trying to be very vain. So dark colors is kind of the colors of the Puritans, the Calvinists, all these sects of group that try to get away from materialism and being more dedicated in their art and their work for God. So the Netherlands... Uh, uh, became Protestant, and we can see in their clothing. Also, anatomy lesson, you know, physical body open up. That's not really not uh, Catholic. That's something that they approve that much. This was considered very big faux pas, like, you know, to see a body uh, open up. We have the night watch. And again, we talk about Baroque, what makes this a Baroque painting. We have the lights, and we got the action. We have the drama. We have these people. So usually you had a group of people just standing to, together, like taking a group selfie. And now you have the night watch with Rembrandt. These guys are walking directly at you in action and drama with the drums. Everyone is situated in a different uh, place. And this, by the way, is a huge, huge painting. That's another thing when we talk about Baroque. It's very, very big in uh, size. Uh, again, Darkness, Conspiracy of Claudius Civilis, uh, famous Dutch story. Rubens also the descending from the cross uh, from the cross. How do I know, for example, this is a Catholic painting? Or I should have asked you what kind of art is this. So I switched it up. How do I know, like for example, that this is this is more uh, that this is a, a Catholic painting and not a Protestant? Anyone? What color would give me the clue? The red. Okay, so one easy way a lot of times to depict Catholic painting is red. Red is very, very, very Catholic. By the way, a lot of times when Catholics got executed by by Protestant, like Mary Tudor, uh, sorry, Mary Queen of Scots, you know, a lot of times their martyrdom color was all about red. You know, uh, Protestants are downers with all their black, and Catholics would like to show more vivid colors. Uh, and finally, another thing that you might want to know about Baroque art is that absolute monarchs also embraced uh, Baroque art. They liked the whole drama and magnitude, and they basically used Baroque art and architecture basically uh, to enhance their grandeur as ruler and promoted. They liked the connection between religious. Uh, you follow the religion the same way you follow me, and I'm just going to use it for my power. Most famous example, of course, is Louis the Fourteen, and the Versailles Palace, we can see that is kind of Baroque art, kind of over the top, a lot of drama, a lot of light coming into that. Or uh, uh, the Bank of Bidding Hall, James I of England, who's on top of the ceiling over here. We can kind of see Rubens, the famous uh, Dutch, uh, Flemish artists who painted this ceiling over here. So that's pretty much what we need to know. Vermeer is also a famous Baroque uh, painter in the Netherlands. And again, painting more day-to-day -day stuff. So it's not all about religion. We're seeing also how he's playing with color, uh, showing himself also in an artist here, painting a lady and what is called the art of painting. Uh, view of Delft, we can see kind of like the vision of the, the city where he lived or is famous, the milkmaid. So that's pretty much what you need to know. Uh, so again, remember, think Fibable, follow Fibable on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. You can check my website. Also a link to my book about Tai Chi and Qigong, anyone who's interested in martial arts or kind of relaxing arts for more meditation and breathing exercise. Check my book up on Amazon. And let's get to Q&A. So wrapping up quickly, we have three art movements to cover all right, so thank you everyone for joining in for this Fiveable stream. 
Um, remember, next week we have another stream. It's going to be about European literature. And again, we're trying to help you prepare for the exam. DBQ, five documents, 45 minutes. Very, very interesting how it's going to go on this year. There might be an opportunity, actually, for some people, I believe, to score a lot higher because of uh, this new format. Uh, if you have uh, bad writing, maybe typing is going to be your friend. Maybe some of you need to practice uh, to, uh, to type more in the house or write essays as preparation. So here in 5.0, we're going to try to help everyone out. If there's no more questions, um, I guess we're going to wrap it up. So thank you, everyone, for joining up. Uh, stay healthy, and I'll see you next week.